Listen, it's, an, it's a, a, an honor for us to be out here today to talk about something I think that is uh, really important. And I think that a lot, you know, some of you probably know, and I guess this is my perspective, I think some of you know probably more about the intimate ways in which uh, drugs are being used by young people in the community than I do. So you have an advantage over me because you know a little bit more about the, the partying and the way things are distributed and how, uh, how many people are using K-Spice, how many people are using marijuana, how many people are using ecstasy, how many people are using heroin. Uh, but I have an advantage over you because I know what the law is. And uh, by the way, my name, I, I'm John McCarthy. I'm the state's attorney for Montgomery County. What does that mean I do? I'm the DA for this county. I oversee the prosecution of 25,000 cases a year in this county. 25,000. The only cases I handle myself are murders. Uh, and so when I come out to your community, usually somebody's dead on the street in your community where you live. But I'm here today because the number of people dying uh, from opiate overdoses, and there, we could get into other substances, but the number of people dying from heroin, fentanyl, and opiates has grown to about 1,000 a year in Maryland. Uh, literally, if I filled this entire auditorium this morning, and every seat was filled, that's how many young people died in this state last year. I think people, pretty, pretty, people are pretty naive about things like heroin. Uh, maybe more your parents than you. And uh, I will tell you, heroin affects every part of the state. You know, for a long time, people thought that heroin only touched Baltimore City. And Baltimore City is touched by heroin. Baltimore City is touched by heroin, and somewhere around 250 people a year die of heroin overdoses in the city. But in the state, it's around 1,000. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's an equal opportunity killer. 70% uh, of the victims, this is a, 70% of the victims of heroin overdose are white. 70% of the heroin victims in Maryland are white. Uh, that's not an applause line either. Uh, how many people are affected by this? Since the year 2000, 400% increase in the number of heroin deaths in Maryland. Since 2011, 300% increase. Why? Well, and, and by the way, if you don't know this, why do people get addicted to heroin? How do people choose heroin? Many of you in this room, I know you've got a great football team. I know you're doing really well. I know you have great athletic teams here, both men's and women's uh, sports and things like that. The gateway to heroin and opiates it's not marijuana. The gateway is typically a good kid who has a sports-related injury. Maybe they uh, had knee surgery because you blew out a knee or you had an ankle. And your doctor prescribed Oxycontin to you. And he became addicted to the Oxycontin. And then the prescription ran out. And he had transitioned from Oxy because you couldn't get it anymore because it's really expensive to buy in the black market, maybe $40 a pill. You transitioned to heroin, which is dirt cheap and cost about 10 bucks a pop. Uh, I live here in Montgomery County. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, people think we don't have any deaths from heroin in Montgomery County. Well, I, I will tell you, over the last, this year, we're at 26. Most of those people are between 18 and 30. 26 this year. Over the last two years, we got 50. Why, why are we here? Well, we're here today to talk about the fact that death can be prevented. What you don't know is there's actually laws. Look, I don't care about lock, I lock a lot of people up. The last 10 cases I did were homicides and people got life without the possibility of parole. They went to jail because they murdered somebody in this community and they're gonna come out in a box. But I've seen too many dead people. And too many young people. We had a judge in our county, a judge, a judge in our county lost her daughter last fall. A judge. I've been to communities like, I've been to communities where you overlooked greens in country club communities, and uh, when we got called out, there's a young man or woman on the floor with a needle in their arm that could not even get the needle out of their arm before, the, before their heart stopped beating. This touches everybody. I will tell you the worst areas, you, know, you may not know this, we were, having, we were having a conversation a minute ago, here just a second ago. The worst communities, we're, we're bad here in Montgomery County by sheer numbers because we're the largest jurisdiction. And we got 50 plus deaths, but we got a million plus people live here. You want to see where the epidemic is worse? Go down to the beach. Go down to Ocean City. 
Go to Western Maryland and Allegheny counties, where their death rate's five or six times ours. It's everywhere. And why is it? Because it's about expense, it's about a variety of things, and the alternatives are not there. Why do we want heroin kills you? This is, and, and I will tell you, that the people that are affected and get into heroin are the ages that you are. And here's here's it's a video. Never the same. And you just chase it, and then you start needing it. You don't want it. You need it. At 16, April boasted a 4.2 GPA with scholarship offers to multiple colleges. While a hard partier on weekends, it wasn't until she fell in love that her life took a turn. We met at a party and he just, you know, we started rolling on ecstasy, doing stuff that we considered party drugs. April started snorting heroin at age 16. I was in a drug dealer's house on the east side of Dayton shooting dope. Like, it just... For me, it happened really quick. The first time I shot it, I was hooked. April, who says she shoots up all day every day, and a couple of hours without heroin makes her deathly ill or dope sick. I'm homeless. I don't have anything. The 20-year-old was kicked out of her home for repeatedly stealing from her mother to buy dope, a high that only lasts minutes or even seconds. If I knew when I was 16 and did that first line of heroin, if I knew what was going to happen, I would have never touched it. You throw your life away. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I teach at Montgomery College. I've taught there for 36 years. Uh, I had a young student who came to me uh, about five years ago. Uh, she, went, she was from the Damascus area. She was in my class. And she goes, my sister is a heroin addict. And, I, I, and I, you know, you're the state attorney. Can you help me find out a, a treatment program to get her, get her you know, off of heroin? She was 17 years old. And I said, I agreed to meet with her. And the girl that was my student's name was Trisha, Damascus High School. And she brought her sister to see me. She walked into the room. She was one of the most beautiful girls I ever saw in my entire life. She was 17 years old. She was then still a Damascus High School student who was taking Route 40 almost daily into Baltimore to score heroin. And she was trading sex for drugs. She was 17 years old. Uh, by the way, if you get hooked on heroin or you get hooked on some of these drugs, here's a number for you. If you are addicted or become addicted to heroin, it is not impossible, but nearly impossible to get off of. Uh, if you, get, uh, you can, and by the way, you can be addicted the very first time you use it. That's just a fact. Not scare straight stuff, just a fact. You can have, you're going to see a video in a second from a girl from Damascus High School. The gateway for heroin into Montgomery County was through Damascus for many years. Now... And that's why did they do that? The drug dealers didn't want to go along 95 because the uh, 95 cops, the state troopers, were looking for heroin coming out of New York on the major thoroughfares. So they took the back roads. And where did our drug, where did our heroin come from? Largely Baltimore. And it came on Route 40 through Damascus. Damascus has been facing um, this, uh, this problem for years. Uh, opiates, prescription painkillers, they're killing people, you know, again, an auditorium full of young people in this state died from what we're here talking about today. Uh, you, you know, so if you could look at this chart, this is kind of, you know, you got economic classes, you got business classes and things like that. You see the, the, the blue line going to the ceiling? That's for heroin. You see that? Yeah. All right. Uh, by that, that chart ends in 2014. If we extended this chart and added in the deaths in Maryland from heroin, overdoses for 2015, the chart doesn't move to the right like it typically does on a graph. It just would go straight to the sky. It just goes straight up. Uh, and there is no region of the state. Now, look, there's other things. Alcohol kills, cocaine kills, but heroin kills. One of the reasons uh, heroin kills, by the way, if you don't know this, heroin is never taken in a pure form. Heroin's cut. Uh, it's cut with something else. Uh, street levels when you bought heroin five years ago in Maryland, it was about 9% pure heroin. Today, it's about 41%. That's why there's more deaths. They also, the cutting agents, there's something on there called fentanyl. That's another opiate. And what drug dealers are doing more and more, because it's a better high, is they're cutting heroin with fentanyl. And fentanyl, together with cocaine, is 100 times more potent. Uh, people who are even experienced heroin, heroin users put the needle in their arm. The people, if you read a story and you ever hear somebody that 
mom and dad walked into the bathroom and they found, you know, Billy or Susie on the floor dead with the needle in their arm, I will absolutely bet you that that heroin was laced with fentanyl because they don't even get the needle out of their arm before the heart stops. That's fentanyl. And, and the bottom line is, you, know, you never know what the cutting agent is. What's the, uh, and by the way, two, two things. What's the number one risk What's the number one risk that somebody's going to die of, of, of an overdose from heroin? Number one risk factor, number one, is having survived an overdose. Number two, coming out of rehab. What? Coming out of rehab. People go into rehab, come out, and you'll see, I, I talked to those moms. I don't know if gets Bethesda, anybody reads Bethesda magazine, there was a cover story. Uh, about a bunch of moms who, uh, who had, uh, were working in the anti-heroin movement here in Montgomery County whose children died, and they'd become active in the campaign because their kids died. Uh, every one of them went to rehab. What happens when you come out of rehab, your body has lost its ability to fight the drug. So you come out of rehab, and mom and dad say, you know what, John was really doing great. He just got out of rehab, but he scored heroin on the way home from rehab, and he's dead because his body could not take the shock to the system, and he dies. You know what they do? Uh, anybody ever see uh, Uma Thurman is in those Kill Bill movies? Anybody remember Uma Thurman, Kill Bill? Everybody, right? The Kill Bill movies, all right? Uma Thurman was uh, in an, a, a movie years ago with uh, uh, John Travolta, where she was married. Everybody, and she dies, she's dying of a heroin overdose, and John Travolta gets a big needle. What the, Pulp, what's the name of it? Pulp Fiction. Anybody see Pulp Fiction? Uma Thurman's laying on the floor, and John Travolta takes a needle, looks like it's about this long, and he stabs, it's adrenaline, and he stabs her directly in the heart with an adrenaline. If you ever see the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he brings her back to life. Well, we do that, not quite as dramatically, but I will tell you, the heroin epidemic is so large that police officers, as well as every medic, every fire rescue person in Montgomery County, carries a thing called uh, Narcon spray. It's, it's, it's not as dramatic as in Pulp Fiction. We're not sticking needles in people's hearts. But what we're doing is we are spraying this, this drug in their nostrils, and if we get there fast enough, that we're here about the Good Samaritan Law, if we get there fast enough and we inject this nasal spray into their nose, we can save that life. Look, I lock people up for a living, and I've been doing it for 35 years. I'm not here to lock anybody up. I'm here to tell you about Good Samaritan laws that say to you, speak up, save a life, make a phone call. If you're in a position where, and we're going to talk about other drugs too, because this is just not about opiates, it's about alcohol, you know, you know the kind of help that you know, girls give each other on Friday nights when their girlfriend gets dead drunk because she broke up with her boyfriend and she's thrown up in the toilet, and your level of care is making sure she doesn't vomit in her own hair. How many been there? Uh, I will, I've got hands just went up, you know, that, they're, they're still, that, you're, that was very nice, you didn't let your, you. good Samaritan laws, what, what do good Samaritan laws mean? If you are using drugs or alcohol and the person you're with gets into a medical emergency, make the phone call. Don't sit there and think, well, geez, what am I going to do? How much trouble am I going to be in? I'm going to tell you, you're not going to be in trouble with us. I think it's more important that somebody's life gets saved that somebody gets convicted of a uh, call me crazy. I think your life matters more than a click in getting somebody convicted of a crime. I think that matters more. So you got to sit there, and if you're in a situation and somebody is in a medical emergency, pick up the phone. You know, let your friend die in their own vomit on the floor, walk away when they stop breathing, ride by a, uh, a hospital and dump them out on the sidewalk and just hope somebody runs out and gets them before they die. I'm telling you, there, there are drugs and things that are anecdotes for these things that if we get there fast enough, we can save that person's life. Look, these Good Samaritan laws, they're, they're in Maryland, and basically if you go up and down the East Coast of the United States, everybody has them. Why? Because everybody's kind of come to their senses about this nonsense. And basically said to people who find themselves with addicts and others that are addicted to drugs, we'd rather you call, we will not prosecute you, to save that life. Don't go into Virginia, don't go into South Carolina, but anywhere else on the East Coast, you're protected. All right? 
Uh, the faster you get help, the more likely somebody's going to survive. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking on these things. Uh, it, it happens very, very fast. And, and again, all emergency response personnel, including the police, now carry that, that little packet, that nasal spray that they can put in somebody's nose. Uh, this is just heroin-related deaths. Uh, the, the chart, again, 2014 goes up to 2015. You can just see that the numbers continue. These are just heroin. Doesn't include fentanyl, doesn't include other opiates and prescription drugs. These are newspaper headlines. Uh, I'm not making this, you can go to Washington Post, you can Google this stuff, you know. Again, this is not scared. These are, there's a difference between what's fact and people coming in to scare you about stuff. I'm not, I'm not here to scare you. I'm not here, I, you know. If I was here to scare you, I'd say, don't do drugs. I'm going to lock you up if you do. That's, a, that's not today's message. That's not today's message. This is a not a lock them up message. This is a save a life message. Uh, heroin uh, collapses veins, blocks blood vessels, paralysis. Did, uh, did I skip over one of the videos? No, OK. Uh, th this is what it does. Uh, highly addictive. Oh, uh, you know what's, a, what's really sad for me? You know, uh, sometimes I talk about getting people into treatment. If 100 people go into treatment and they're addicted to heroin and they stay in treatment for 90 days and come out, what percentage nationally have beaten heroin in 90 days? 100 people go in, they're in 90 days treatment. What does 90 days treatment mean? The answer is about 4% will beat it. 96% will come out and still have the same problem. Why? Heroin is tough to beat. Some of these drugs are so powerful. Uh, I am told by the experts in the field that if you're going to treat someone for heroin addiction, you've got to keep them in treatment a minimum of one year. Anything short of a year, it's basically throwing your money out the window. You are just wasting your time because the drug is too powerful. The highly addictive drug heroin, as derived from morphine, is bad enough in destroying lives, including the recent death of actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. However, heroin tainted with an artificial version of morphine called fentanyl is around 100 times stronger and has resulted in dozens of deaths throughout the U.S. A recent batch containing fentanyl has circulated around the state of Maryland, causing a minimum of 37 deaths since September 2013. This is a very dangerous substance and can cause immediate death. Essentially, it causes you not to breathe, and it may be that you know, personnel, med medical personnel cannot get too fast enough. While 10 of the 37 deaths happened in the city limits of Baltimore, the other cases have been reported by counties all across the state. At the Northwest DC clinic called Bread for the City, medical attention is offered to heroin users. The clinic said since Thanksgiving 2013, there was a dramatic increase in requests for Narcan, another drug serving as an antidote for overdose effects. To prevent overdoses, some Maryland counties have started to organize additional workforces. Again, what we're talking about, this is, you're going to see media and you're going to see um, stories about this stuff. And I'm going to show you a couple of other videos in a second. Uh, you can overdose the first time you use, by the way. You can overdose the first time you use. You can suffer withdrawal symptoms only if you use it once. And uh, this young lady, as a matter of fact, Ms. Dempsey and I were talking about this. Your principal has had this young woman speak at her school's, uh, Ms. Dempsey knows Leah. She went here. She had her at Shady Grove. Uh, this is a real story. This is a young lady. This story is about 10 years old. She's from the Damascus region. And she, this is what happened to her the first time she used heroin. She's having a meltdown. This is what can happen from taking heroin just once. My life back so bad. 17 year old Leah Edgecombe is totally dependent on others and she doesn't like it one bit. I'm either in this bed or standing up today. At physical therapy, like seeing what I can't do anymore. Oh, the best part. And it just really, it, it sucks. This honor student is now a quadriplegic. 
I was just being a selfish bitch. That's pretty much it. Leah's life changed on June 4th, 2009. That day she was mad at the world. She had just broken up with her boyfriend and had a fight with her mother. She went to a friend's house. And I was high from smoking marijuana. I was not at the right state of mind. She and her friend then snorted heroin for the first time. My body reacted way different to it than my friend's. Leah went into cardiac arrest. For eight minutes, her brain was without oxygen. She suffered severe brain damage and was in a coma for a month. I believe that God saved me so I could save other people's lives. P. J. The last year has been about regaining her communication skills and stretching her sometimes twisted body to its limit, hoping to regain some mobility. Love you. No one knows if she will ever walk again, but Leah is determined and she wants other kids to heed her warning. If you think your life sucks now, think of your life in a bed 24-7. Think twice before you do anything as stupid as what I did. Leah is hoping to share her story in schools. She says kids are not exposed to real life stories like hers. Leah believes if she had met someone like herself earlier, she never would have tried drugs. Andrea Roan, 9 News Now. First time user breaks up with her boyfriend, goes over to her friend's house. She's a little bit high. I think she was smoking marijuana or something like that. And doing heroin or a couple lines of heroin sounded like a good idea for her that night. Uh, she lives right down the street. If you watch the news tonight, I can tell you Channel 7's here. They're, you're going to see her because you're going to go back and interview her again. Uh, heroin doesn't make you a quadriplegic. But when you stop breathing for eight minutes because her heart stopped and she stopped breathing, that's why she became a, a quadriplegic. And this is a young girl right up the street. This that girl's not far from here. Uh, uh, how do you recognize overdoses, convulsions, impaired speech, confusion, tremor, slow breathing, drowsiness? And so, so a lot of these things sometimes can be confusing because they look a lot like some of the other, and sometimes you see some of these same things with alcohol. But again, it's the same kind of symptoms. What would you do? You know, uh, what happens if a person can barely walk uh, you know, there, there are some things you can do. I, look, I, I was talking about this the other day. Uh, the, I'm old enough that I, my places where people that are my age drink too much, yeah. Uh, and if somebody, I think, is a friend of mine is going to try to drive their car and leave, we hide their keys. You know, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I will tell you in the next couple of weeks, I don't know, I, don't th I hope it's nobody in this room, but uh, I'm going to get a phone call about a group of teenagers under the influence of something, probably more likely alcohol than anything else, that wrapped themselves around a tree. Let me just tell you something. Car plus tree, tree wins. Car plus tree, tree wins. And a tree didn't have to be very big. I've seen trees that were maybe a f not much fatter around than my arm that have killed people because they don't bend. And you stop and you have head injuries. There are a few options. Uh, if you're overdosing, position to recovery. So let, me, can, let me go to this. Look, recovery position. This is true for alcohol and for this. If you have a person who is beginning, not, not, put them into a recovery position. Roll them to their side, bottom arm under their head, make sure there's nothing blocking their airway. I guess this is one step up from making sure that the vomit doesn't go into their hair when they're throwing up in the toilet. Put them into recovery position. The worst thing you can do this is for any drug or alcohol. The worst thing you can do is to leave somebody just laying flat on their back and walk away. Why? They can actually literally vomit and suffocate in their own vomit. It's not a very pretty thought, but you have to roll people over to the side, put them in the recovery. Beyond heroin, alcohol does some of the same things, can do permanent damage to you. And I'm, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on alcohol, but because I'm sure other people have talked to you about alcohol, and there are other programs when we'll come back and talk about alcohol. But again, there are, you know what the symptoms are. I, there's probably nobody here that's been through high school. You're seniors in high school. Whether you were down Beach Week last year or you got to look, you've all seen it. You know exactly what the symptoms are. Call 911. There, there are young people that die of alcohol poisoning every year in this county and every year in this state. Those deaths are on top of the fentanyl, on top of the heroin, on top of the alcohol, on top of the prescription drugs. Uh, 
I don't, you know, I don't know how big ecstasy is. You know, that first girl that we saw, she talked about ecstasy. One of her gateways to heroin was she was doing uh, the party drug ecstasy. All right. Uh, there's also cocaine, which last year 200 people died from cocaine. Uh, so I want to talk about synthetic marijuana. By the way, this has absolutely nothing to do with marijuana. There is no such thing as synthetic, well, there is such a thing as what's called synthetic marijuana. The K-Spice stuff that you buy, this crap that you buy in these stores sold as Scooby-Doo or Mr. Nice or K2 or Spice, most of the stuff is manufactured in garages in China. It is not marijuana. It is not marijuana. It is not marijuana. It's crap spelled with, sp sprayed with chemicals and whatever K2 spice you used one time, if you buy another brand, I'm going to tell you, you got no idea what you're getting. Absolutely no idea. Uh, it causes vomiting, paranoia, cold sweats, heads rushes, hallucinations. The uh, re reason I talk about K spice, about 90% of all the K spice that's used in the United States is used by high school students. About 90% of all the K2 is used by high school students. Tonight, 11 overdose outbreak is alarming health officials and social workers. Emergency crews responded to multiple overdose scenes today and fear this could be part of a growing trend. News Force Jackie Benson is at Freedom Plaza tonight with the synthetic marijuana threat. Jackie? Well, Doreen, this is still going on right now. Um, uh, one group of paramedics has been literally going from place to place within a fairly small uh, several block area all afternoon and all evening. Now, this is especially frightening because a University of Maryland study showed that 70 percent of the people who use this drug are teenagers. This ambulance is headed to a hospital and followed by a police cruiser. Inside is the 11th overdose victim paramedics have tended to since 1 o'clock this afternoon. They suffered symptoms that included terrible stomach cramps, vomiting, hallucinations, and agitation. All were found in a few block area between Union Station and the CCNV homeless shelter at 2nd and D Streets Northwest. We found this wrapper on the ground nearby. It was labeled Mr. Nice Guy, a brand of strawberry-flavored synthetic marijuana. Homeless outreach advocate Eric Sheptock says he encountered an obviously ill woman near the Georgetown Law School. I saw a woman who I thought was drunk. Uh, she was leaning on, on this pole where there used to be a parking meter, and she was peeking. A and uh, so I stopped to help her, and, 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 and she, she, she wasn't responsive at all, but, but then I, I laid her down and I called 911. Police believe the drugs were sold this afternoon in an open-air market that has long plagued the homeless shelter and draws customers from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. They suspect that a large shipment of really strong drugs came in from New York City. Uh, I can't keep up with all the different types of drugs. If they're the same drug with different names or if they're actually different substances, but I hear the names like Scooby, Zorro, Bizarro, K2, and that now this one called Trainwreck, which, which is a combination drug. The bottom line on this is D.C. and Maryland have both reportedly seen a sharp increase in the number of overdoses due to this new and apparently much more potent type of synthetic marijuana, which is illegal in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Back to you. And Jackie, the Maryland Poison Center says 40 percent of people who use these synthetic drugs suffer from increased heart rate. The drugs can also cause heart attacks, seizures, or trouble breathing. Last year, synthetic drugs were the third most likely source of overdoses. And so far this year, there have been more cases than last. You know what happened here? Uh, we have a drug court, and what happened is that people that were in a, a drug court, a diversionary program, began to use synthetic marijuana uh, as a way of, uh, of uh, evading drug testing. Well, we now test for synthetic marijuana as well. Uh, it, 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 I, I've met with parents of, of, of people in this county. When parents groups come to me, say, can we meet with you to talk about a public awareness campaign about synthetic marijuana? It kills people. You know, uh, can I tell you, synthetic marijuana, that's an insult to marijuana. That's an insult to marijuana. This has nothing to do with marijuana. This is chemicals. These are chemicals 
from a garage in China, put into this packaging that makes it look like you're doing something with Scooby-Doo and could kill you. Uh, real cases, uh, again, uh, synthetic spice was sickening 41. Uh, prescription drugs, you know, again, uh, I, I will tell you a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of you are great athletes in this room. I know that. Maybe some of you are even going on to play college basketball. My, my, believe it or not, my, my youngest son just graduated from college. He was a college All-American, six foot three. He made the All-American team in basketball last year. It's true. You can look it up. Uh, I know what it means to be a great athlete. I know that, that athletes can get injured. I, my son had his tonsils out after, he, after the last season, and, and I went and, uh, and the, after I took his tonsils out, they gave him a half a gallon of Oxycontin, liquid Oxycontin. I was terrified. I was like, one, one of the big problems in the area that we have, it's not just you guys being aware, one of the huge problems we have in controlling the epidemic with heroin is getting the medical community on board not to overprescribe drugs that are not necessary to young people. I will tell you, it's also the military's there, because what's happening is the military is, is realizing that they've been overusing these drugs, and kids are coming out of the military after one or two years of service, got minor injuries in the service, and they come out addicts because the military doctors are giving away these, these opiates, like oxy, like candy. Um, look at this progression. I, okay, I hope you, I don't know if you're going to vote. I know this guy. Well, let me say this. I knew this guy because he's dead. All right? Look at this picture. What does drugs do to your body? Well, this is, uh, this dude, he's coming in. It's, this says February 20th, 1993. He's going to be dead in about two years after this picture. But just, I'm looking at him. He looks like a leftover hippie, pretty lousy, stringy hair, probably needs his hair washed but he looks like a kind of normal dude, all right? Uh, now you see him, we've jumped to December of that same year, his face is beginning to shrink, he, his shoulders are narrower, he's beginning to lose weight. This is probably about 10 months later. Now we are in July of the next year, he's beginning to look a little skeletal. Same guy, same guy. Body changes with drugs. Same guy, we're in December. We are now uh, about 11 months, or I mean, uh, 13 months later, 14 months later. Uh, by the way, that's, look at him in the beginning. Drugs can do that to your body. Uh, by the way, that, he died about 60 days later. Uh, by the time he got to the December 5th picture in 1994, he looked like somebody who survived the concentration camp in Germany. But he did that to himself with drugs. Uh, uh, drugs, uh, drugs uh, again, look, I, I know a lot of you, you know, it's, it's funny, I think a lot of you are very health conscious. I, look, this is not the, the entire message, but a lot of you are health conscious. If you, you know, if you smoke cigarettes, this is what lungs look like. That's what lungs look like. Uh, uh, by the way, a lot of heroin addicts, you know, you, uh, to hide tracks and to hide the fact they're using heroin or using drugs, a lot of people inject, you know, you go to the dentist, and they, they, inject, they, in, they inject in their mouths. Uh, the problem is ultimately your teeth fall out. Uh, another place, another hiding place for heroin addicts, by the way, is between their toes. Toes are, toes are big. It's easy to find, I, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know, sticking stuff in your toes. That sounds like it hurts to me, I don't know. But, uh, um, you know, learning how to say no to anything, learning how to say no is, I, I mean, some of you, I, I know, is, aren't you, isn't your football team still in the playoffs, right? Yeah, you're going for another, your back-to-back -back state titles. He's shaking his head. You're on the team? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Yes, sir, I'm on the team. All right. But do you sign a pack, you know, just saying no, do you, do you have a contract that you sign with your teammates and your, your uh, coach that you're not going to use drugs during the season because you're making a commitment to each other? Well, there's ways to say no. My parents would kill me. I'm an athlete. No thanks. I'd rather not make a fool of myself. I have to wake up tomorrow. I have a test. I've got, you know, learn how to say no. Uh, also, learn how, to, learn how to be proactive in protecting your friends, hiding their keys and some of the stuff we said before. I do, I do want to make sure you see this. I, I, believe it or not, this happens more often on weekends in Montgomery County than you ever think. This happens all the time. I'm really tight with my friends. We do everything together. 
and whatever happens, they look out for me. That's a public service announcement, and I actually like this spot. It makes a point. But I'm going to tell you, that happens every weekend in Montgomery County. I don't, Shady Grove, New Holy Cross, the Old Holy Cross, Adventist Hospital. There will be one or two young people dropped at the doorstep every weekend. Now, what we're here talking about is, is this the way you treat a friend? Or do you take advantage of the Good Samaritan laws that we were actually talking about today? You put them in a recovery position. You make sure that they're in a position where they're not going to choke before the authorities get there. And you call 911. And I don't know what the, the substance could be alcohol. It could be spice. It could be heroin. Some of, you know, it's funny, I, I was talking to Ms. Dempsey before, and, you know, I don't know that there's a lot of heroin necessarily going on in here. But I'll tell you what, maybe there is. Maybe there's other drugs that are being used. And our message is about saving lives. Our message, I don't want to lock anybody up. But I don't want to be standing with your parents when we bury somebody here. That's it. It's a pretty simple message. Uh, and, and look, I, I, I spent a lot of my life putting bad, as my kids used to say, put bad people in jail. I'm not looking to put anybody in jail. I'm looking to make sure that someday you can live in this community with your family, be a contributing member of this community, and have a, live your life. So listen, it was a great honor to be here with you. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thanks very much. I hope you heard our message.